tonight the topic is freedom, determinism, and foreknowledge, all of which are long disputed questions in the history of Western thought. There is a story around about two clubs, a determinist club who were all committed to the notion that everything that happens, including even our thoughts and feelings, are caused, and therefore there is no freedom. And then there was a free willist club across town who believed that we have power and autonomy and therefore act freely. He decided to join the determinists. So he went across town and signed up, and and they said, no, uh, we cannot permit that because it appears that you made a free choice to join us. So he went across town to join the others, and they said, no, we can't admit you because you were forced to come to this decision. It left him helpless. The five definitions we need to work with from classical philosophy are to wit. Number one, uh, fatalism is the view that some or all of events, and man is defined as an event, are by some exterior force pre-caused. So, for example, in Greek thought there is talk of M-O-I-R-A, moira, which roughly translates destiny. Of course, one can substitute the name of God for fate and maintain with, say, the Calvinists, that God both pre-caused and preordained all events. Specifically, he pre-caused those who are headed to heaven, and he pre-caused those who end up in hell, which seems to obliterate totally any notion of freedom or responsibility. When the question was raised to Calvin how he reconciled that with justice on the part of God, he replied, do not question the inscrutable will of God. It is alleged that someone went to a fortune teller and said, I want you to tell me where I am going to die. Would you look in your crystal ball and tell me? And the fortune teller asked, why do you want to know? And he replied, because if I can find out, I'll never go there. But you see, (laughs) the conviction about fate is that you have no choice. You will, in fact, go there. So much for the notion of fatalism. Now, related to those only in the scientific juncture are two other major traditions. One is called mechanism and the other behaviorism. A mechanism, to use a metaphor, simply says that you are a machine. If uh, you have a Swiss watch, there are certain movements and motions that are possible, but those are the only motions, and once it is fixed in the form of a watch, that settles the question. You are a machine, and you have moving parts, as it were, but they are all destined and predestined in certain functional ways. Or behaviorism, probably defended most by B.F. Skinner, who, it is alleged, taught pigeons to play ping-pong. He is the one who was refuted, in quotes, by someone who heard him stand up and hold up a candle. I don't know if this story is true, but it makes the point. Held up a candle, said, Now, the candle burns, I put my finger in the flame, it hurts, and I pull it away. That is behaviorism. All human conduct is action and reaction to such stimuli. An opponent stood, lit the candle, and said, Yes, I light the candle, I put my finger in the flame, it hurts, and I grit my teeth and hold it there. That is freedom. Determinism is sometimes broken into two main categories among philosophers, hard and soft. Hard determinism simply maintains that ultimately there is nothing that occurs that is not caused and that man is not himself a cause but an effect, in fact a bundle of effects, essentially the product either of his heredity or his environment or both. You may have heard of the high school student who came home with a really pitiful report card 
sat down at the dinner table, showed it to his parents, and then said, Which do you think it is, heredity or environment? <laughs> Most parents would probably reply that there is a third factor here. Soft determinism simply redefines the situation and says something like this, that if you are not compelled to do something from some external force, as a billiard ball is pushed into a pocket, if, in other words, given whatever bombardments there are from without, you nevertheless make a choice as you feel, then we will define your freedom as not compelled. And that's called soft determinism. However, the bottom line is that though you can choose to do what you want to do, you cannot choose what you want. The want is already somehow there in terms of prior motivational forces. Now let me relate what we've said so far to our understanding and we will sooner or later be back to questions that pertain to the very nature of God. We have a most remarkable, I would say radical, thesis, which we find most clearly in section 93 of the Doctrine and Covenants. It says, all intelligence is free to act for itself in that sphere in which God has placed it. You may reply, wait, it doesn't say that. It says, all truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it. So it does, but then it adds, as all intelligence also. We assume from other sources that intelligence was placed in a certain sphere, namely in a spirit body, and then in turn that intelligence and spirit body were placed, as you were born, into a physical body. So one of the inherent traits of intelligence is freedom. So what then does it mean to say that freedom or free agency is a gift of God? I, the Lord, make you free indeed, for example. Well, the answer is that God could have exercised His power in a way to be coercive or compulsive, threatening, cajoling, blackmailing. But he will not. We are told he cannot force anyone to heaven. He not just will not, he cannot. Why not? Because freedom is inherent, and if you choose to exercise your freedom against God, you can do so, and even can do so forever. Now that's both an exhilarating and a frightening realization. You cannot be forced to grow, to respond, to seek redemption, to bring Christ into your life, and finally to reach levels of perfection. If you choose to and cooperate, you can, otherwise not. So we have this unique and radical beginning thesis. And what I have just said also applies to another rather popular superstition. It sums up in the television phrase, the devil made me do it. Well, I couldn't help myself, the devil did that. Such views as are entertained on that point are, in the words of the prophet Joseph Smith, absurd. Let me read you just three sentences. Number one, all men have power to resist the devil. Number two, God will not exert any compulsory means, and the devil cannot. And third, the devil has no power over us only as we permit him. There is a footnote to that. He once said, speaking of the devil, he is subtle, and I can only curb him by being humble. Let me ask, who has had a look at the Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Well, 
there are two comments in there that are, for me, profound about the strategies of the underworld. One is when the representative of the devil complains that the man he's been trying to influence on earth is humble and therefore unreachable, the devil replies, yes, he is. Have you reminded him of that lately? The other line uh, pertains to the notion widespread that we think of the adversary doing his best work by putting certain ideas in our heads, as if he had three prongs and the red face, as in the cartoons, and says, do this. But, says the devil to his earthly henchmen, no. We do our most effective work by keeping certain ideas out. Distraction, distortion, preoccupation, drowning out the deeper and richer insights that could be in us is the game. And our generation is much afflicted with this sort of distortion. The point is, if you are free, then you have power of autonomy to deal, not just with God and or the devil, you have power to deal with the impacts of your environment and even in a measure of your heredity. That means that we are responsible. And in the perspective of the Latter-day Saints, when you raise questions, as is common, about why did you get me into this, the echo comes back, why did you get you into this? You see, unfortunately or not, we not only elected to enter into this stage of life, this second estate, we not only elected to come, we prepared, we trained, and apparently with great anticipation, pled to come. We even may have had something to say about the when and the where and the circumstances. So we're here by a condition of our own making. Do you know the dilemma that you put a friend in if you are, let's say, on your way to either Reno or Las Vegas, and you give him some of your money, enough to pay for the hotels and other things, and say, now look, you, you just take care of that. Because if I come and ask you for it, I want you to say no. He agrees. You make a promise, both of you. But then, after all kinds of losses, you run to him and say, give me the money I made you promise not to give me if I asked for it. And now what does a true friend do? Does he honor the second request in desperation, or does he keep his agreement? As per the first, I suggest to you that's a metaphor for our relationship with God. We made certain promises and covenants, and so did He. Now, when we want to say, Stop the world so I can get off, <laughs> He is in a bind. My experience is He will honor the first agreement He made with you and not your second level request. And you will eventually thank Him for that, but maybe not very soon. I once was in a conversation with uh, President Rex Lee. This was after he had had severe surgery and treatment for incurable cancer. He had read in an essay of mine about how uh, two men, both from the primitive areas of Africa, come to America. One of them has a terrible stomach ache, is taken by a modern surgeon into a hospital, and when his friend walks in, he sees for the first time, surgery underway. He sees his friend laid out and unconscious. He sees people in white digging into his stomach with knives. And he makes three assumptions. Number one, they have done this against the will of my friend. Number two, they're trying to kill him. And the number three, the best thing I can do is uh, to pull them off right now, get him out of here. Wrong, wrong, and wrong. Uh, number one, he consented to the, uh, to the operation and wrote to, with his ex, if he didn't know how to write his name, a consent that said, in addition to, yes, take out my appendix, said, take out anything else that's in trouble in there while you're in there. Number two, they are not trying to take his life, they're trying to save it. And number three, the worst thing his friend can do would be to pull him away from them until the operation is completed. There's an analogy 
to real life in that simple story. Well, now we must introduce the other part of this issue of freedom. It relates to foreknowledge. How is it, if we are genuinely free, that we can predict and or control behavior? I say, how can we? The, the issue is, how can God? The fact of prophecy is a fact we, more than anyone in the religious world, take seriously, that God is able to make predictions and to inspire even his mortal servants to do so. And it is a test of prophecy that it comes to pass. But if we are genuinely free, how is that possible? As I read our revelations, it is clear that he says, all things are present before mine eyes. But to say that that means there is no past for God, there is no present for God and no future, is, I think, a distortion or a misreading of the word present. It follows, if we take our own heritage seriously, that if he knows about the future, he knows it by anticipation. And when you, in fact, arrive at your destination in his presence, he will then know it as actual for the first time. It will be actual and accomplished, and he will know it as such. Heretofore, he could only have known it as possibility. Now, let me push the dilemma a little more sharply. If we say that the Union Pacific train will arrive in Provo at exactly 6 o'clock tomorrow night, and if we say that with absolute foreknowledge, which is what we ascribe to God, then it must arrive at 6 o'clock. Not one minute before, not one minute after, or not, not arrive at all. It must arrive. There is a kind of necessity that is imposed by saying it is known that X will occur. However, those who want to deny that that uh, affects our freedom point out that the knowing on the part of God does not cause the event to occur. His knowing, therefore, of something you will or won't do does not bring it to pass. That would be equivalent to saying that if he knows you can graduate, you do not need to study further. No. Uh, if he knows you will graduate, then he has to know you both will study and will be entitled to graduate. Does that interfere with freedom? I suggest to you that if you have to choose between the affirmation that you are genuinely free and the affirmation that God knows your future, you cannot have both, either logically or otherwise, then the tendency in our heritage is to say, I go with freedom. And then you save God's foreknowledge by something like the following rationale. All prophecy, or at least most of it, is conditional. If certain conditions are fulfilled, then certain results will follow. That's a safe prophecy. But it doesn't determine that the event will occur. Or one could say, there are some prophecies which are unconditional, but if you analyze them, they are not based on any if clauses that pertain to us. They are based on something else. For example, the question is, when will the second coming of the Messiah occur? We are told, A, we do not know, B, we will not know, and C, not even the angels in heaven know. But that doesn't prevent speculation, does it? Some say that this event is conditional on our becoming sufficiently prepared, which is to say sufficiently righteous. There must be a righteous remnant of the human family prepared to meet him 
And that hasn't happened yet. Others say, which is almost the contradiction of that, that it will only occur when the world itself has sufficiently ripened in iniquity. So the world hasn't gotten bad enough yet for the return. But the revelation I suggest to you, namely section 77 of the Doctrine and Covenants, says that Christ will come at the beginning of the seventh 1,000-year periods since the advent of Adam. Which means that if we had an accurate calendar, if we really knew precisely the amount of time that has elapsed, properly measured by solar or lunar calendars, we would know at least the year, if not the day or hour, of the coming of the Messiah. That seems to be a declaration of divine intent. I am going to come that time, and therefore whether the world is ripened in iniquity or righteous with its remnant or both, still it has been preset. So he can prophesy confidently, I am coming. What he doesn't do is tell us when. I have a suspicion he doesn't want to tell us so that we will, in our quiet inner moments, ask ourselves, since it could be tomorrow, hadn't I better prepare? If you knew it was 150 years from now, would that affect your life at all? I don't know. Wilfred Woodruff was once asked the question, what did he think? And he said, I would live as if it were tomorrow, but I would plant cherry trees. Cherry trees, uh, they take a long time to grow. In the realm of physics, there is a remarkable phenomenon which has been made newly public by the Nobel Prizes, known as the Heisenberg Principle. I am only a layman, but I will try to explain briefly. It is impossible when you get down to the subatomic level to predict accurately the position as well as the velocity of atoms or subatomic particles, and the more light you shed upon them to establish both position and velocity, the faster they move and therefore the harder it is to predict. And some call this the Heisenberg principle of indeterminacy as if to say that it isn't really, even at that level, a strict cause and effect situation in matter. And some therefore argue if that's the case in inorganic matter, why should we worry as to whether man, who is alive and has mind, why should we worry about the question of whether he is free? The Nobel Prize was given to two scientists who have learned somehow to slow down the movements of the subatomic particles by a form of temperature change, and apparently that will have practical effects in making atomic clocks more accurate than they are now. The point I'm making is that there are physicists who use that argument in favor of human freedom. Well. I return to the point that we take freedom for granted, and then we add two other points which I would consider not scientific but introspective, which do have a powerful influence in our self-fulfillment. Number one, if you do not really believe you are free, if there isn't at least a lingering suspicion in your mind that you're free, that you could help even some things you say you couldn't help, then there cannot arise in your life any guilt. Since there is no one in the room who hasn't felt guilt, I suggest that itself is a kind of inward introspective argument for freedom. We try to escape any such feelings by saying, I could not help it. I couldn't help it. But in many of the situations where we say that, we are telling a half-truth. We have reached the point, for example, if we have begun with one drink of alcohol and then compounded the thing until we are now addicts, we can say truly, if you told me that having one more drink would kill me, 
I would still drink it. I can't help myself. It's an obsession. But the voice of conscience will also say to you, if you listen, there was a time when you could have helped it. On the day when you first were presented the alternatives of a drink or no drink, you had complete and sovereign autonomy. You could have said no. But you yourself made the sequential set of choices leading to that. The other consequence of really believing you're not free would mean that you would have to give up totally any judgment of regret in your life. And this point was seen by the ancient Greeks. This is what Stoicism is all about. The Stoics came into being with two theses, one that some things have to happen inevitably, and at the other end of it, the most one can do about those things is to accept them with total composure and resignation. It's only when you suppose that you have any control whatever of the inevitable that you start regretting what happened here or what happened there. But if you really believe everything that happens has to happen, how can you regret? The Alcoholics Anonymous people have a famous prayer, and you know it. God help me to know the difference between the things I can change and the things I cannot. Well, in Book of Mormon terms, there's another way of saying that. There are things to act, and there are things to be acted upon. Man is among the things that act. William James, the American psychologist and pragmatist, once observed, my first act of free will will be to believe in free will. And he argued in a famous essay that those who believe that life and the events and problems of it are absolutely beyond our control tend to become passive, inactive, the opposite of proactive. And that he considered a bad mistake for cultures as well as for people. It happens that dialectical materialism, the fundamental undergirding philosophy of Marxism, maintained that there is an inevitable thrust in history and that we cannot stop it, we cannot start it, we are part of it, and that it will eventually emerge in a classless society. And yet even the Marxists, in order to encourage the followers of Marxism, kept saying, workers of the world, unite, and kept saying that though you could not prevent nor achieve this ultimate result, you could, by your action, hasten it. So even there is a kind of an implicit, smuggled-in assumption that freedom will work. Now, given our premises, let me talk about some implications. Is mind, or the free exercise of mind, or intelligence, really equal to or even overpowering of what we call matter? Mary Baker Eddy, who was the American founder of Christian Science, maintained that the only reality in this universe is pure mind. There is, in Christian science philosophy, no matter. Matter is an illusion. You think there is matter. But the whole point of Christian science is to get you to think again until you recognize you are a victim of error. It follows You've never seen a Christian science hospital. A hospital is built, first of all, with the assumption that bricks are real, but secondly, on the assumption that once it's built, people who have physical problems can come there and have the problems healed or solved. But there are no Christian science hospitals. What are there? Christian science reading rooms. If you think that your leg is broken, you're a victim of error. You go 
to the Christian Science reading rooms. You pull down the book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, you read, and hopefully get past your error. May I say, not wanting to be cynical, that I believe Christian science is at least 30% true. And what I'm talking about is the placebo effect. If you give a pill to this man and a pill to this man, and then a non-pill to a third man, but it looks the same, one of those three, on, on the basis of the placebo alone, will be bettered. That is, one out of three in any given set of experiments. In other words, there is tangible evidence that the mind can somehow overcome some physical problems without any physical props. I'm intruding a glimpse of my own struggle when I tell you that I once was in the hospital for surgery on my lower back, I asked for and received medication. It was morphine. And in the first couple of days, it was the only way I could get through, even an hour. But now I'm into the third day, and uh, I pull the chain. We're more modern now, but that was to get the attention of a nurse who, through a loudspeaker, said, Yes, Mr. Madsen. I said, Could I please have Another shot? <laughs> no, uh, no, Mr. Matson. The doctor says that uh, you've had all you can take without becoming addicted. Oh, please, just one more. I, I only need one more. I promise I won't be addicted. Just bring me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I kept begging, and finally she said, "Well, uh, well, just a minute. Uh, I'll be there." Well, I heard her coming, and uh, the sound of her feet in the hall was measurably comforting. Relief is coming. It's coming. She came and gave me a shot, but it was not morphine. It was a fake. And I waited, waited for the relief, and it did not come. I may say that helps me understand two passages. One about how beautiful are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings. I understand that. <laughs> and the other is that when he makes a promise to heal, no placebos, no fakes, it heals. Well, I'm a little off the track. The implication of assurance that you are free involves you being responsible. The scriptures presuppose not only that you are responsible, but that you also know much more than you sometimes acknowledge you know about right and wrong, about good and bad, and about the light versus the darkness. The same revelation that says we are free also says, Behold, this is the condemnation of man, that that which was from the beginning is plainly manifest unto them, and they receive not the light. And every man's spirit that receiveth not the light, I take it to mean welcomes, receives, rather than suppresses and ignores. Every man whose spirit receiveth not the light, is under condemnation. We want to claim we do not know to get off the hook. The truth is that we do, and we are responsible for suppressing that knowledge. Next, there is a connection to what we've been saying to the misunderstanding of law that is rampant in the world today. Law, no matter whether you're talking about eternal laws, and Joseph Smith does, or you're talking about laws that have been instituted and established in a given commonwealth, law does not tell you what you have to do. It cannot control your freedom. You are free to choose whether you will or will not follow. Law simply tells you what the inevitable consequences will be of what you choose. That's not coercive. That's simply a declaration of reality. 
Consequences follow on certain courses of action. God does not threaten us with them. He simply announces them and then pleads with us to obey laws that lead to growth and to obey His ultimate will, not, again, coercively, but because we want to harmonize with Him freely and fully. And law, therefore, is emancipating instead of destructive of our autonomy. Which leads to another significant Latter-day Saint insight. We talk a great deal about covenant. What is a covenant? It's a promise. We make it in sober settings and in certain witnessed forms. And we not only say we will and will not do certain things, we avoid saying, well, I'll give it a college try, or for 30 days I'll experiment, or maybe I'll be there. Now, we say, and this is mind-boggling, that we will and or will not do certain things forever. We call these everlasting covenants, and we are asked to make them as soon as we are mature enough to understand the implications. In passing, I should say, I've occasionally felt resentment that it was too early, as it seems to me, for most of the covenants I made in my youth. But I now thank whatever powers there are that this opportunity and privilege has given us early because you literally shake the heavens when you say, I will forever. That is powerful. It emulates the very covenant of God himself with Moses and Abraham, earlier still with Adam, and it is the beginning of a full-fledged relationship when at last he can say, all right, all right, now I trust you. Now I can give you much, much more and trust you with it. Since, as again our modern prophet says in a couple of sermons, suspense is one of the painful experiences of life, not knowing what A, you're going to do, and B, what the consequences will be, we most of us tend to wish to be out of suspense. We wish for a blueprint, for example, which removes the if clauses and just says, this is exactly what's going to happen year by year ahead of you. That does not happen. I know of no instance where such a blueprint has been given. Nudges at crucial turning points, uh, flashes of insight, uh, prophetic glimpses, these happen. But the total picture, no. So we go on in suspense. But there is a glorious promise built in modern revelation and there are precedents in the Bible that talk about a condition which is known as entering into the Lord's rest. I used to think that meant getting R&R, &R, being relieved, as it were, of the daily pressures and just simply having a vacation or a cessation of activities. And in the Mormon Church, there's not very much of that. We are active. Do, do, do. Act. That's what was on, I'm told, President Kimball's desk. Do it. They say that J. Golden Kimball would have added to do it, damn it. But in any case, <laughs> we believe in action. We believe in performance. So rest was misread by Brother Madsen. That's not what he's talking about. Entering into the Lord's rest has at least two facets. It means coming out of the wilderness. It means coming home. It means even face-to-face -face communion with God. That's how Moses used the phrase. But it also means something close to what we call sealing. What is sealing? Well, we are sealed to certain promises. We're also sealed to those closest to us in family bonds. And we are told that it is possible eventually to have come so far in our probation that the assurance is given, in effect, you are no longer 
really on trial. You may have more missions and more trials, but you're not on trial in terms of your relationship with me. Your calling, your election, your role is secure. Well, as an extension, I take it, of this teaching about genuine freedom, the Prophet Joseph Smith alerts us that there cannot be a seal against the ultimate transgression. And what is that? That's what we call perdition. And in his metaphor, that means standing out in the midst of the summer solstice at high noon, knowing that you are now being blessed with the magnificent rays of the sun and shaking your fist and saying, I choose deliberately and forever darkness. That's perdition. It isn't just that you have received the Holy Ghost and denied it. It is that you reject the Holy Ghost while it is fully upon you. How could anyone make such a decision? It is an imponderable. But that some have is in the record. That's the power of freedom. But such a person, notice, is not placed in darkness and then a chain and lock and a key applied. He is the one who locks the door against God and against Christ forever. He locks it from the inside. He prefers to serve Master Mahan. In closing, there is freedom from, which is an expression we use for the trammels of uh, policemen and etc. But there is also freedom for, and the scriptures dwell on this much more than on the first kind of freedom. What is that? Well, an acorn has the capacity and the potential to become an oak. It can become less than that. It can wither and die. But it cannot become a redwood. An acorn is a potential oak. The same goes, apparently, in the animal kingdom. The posterity of a bear apparently cannot become a giraffe or an alligator. There are kinds. We are not the products of a shipbuilder who made a ship, but the sired offspring of divine parentage. We therefore inherit the potential to become like them. And freedom to become continues even when we are in jail or terribly delimited physically or even mentally. The freedom to become can be working in our lives daily, regardless of our external circumstances. So in that sense, we are truly and invincibly free, and no one can take that away from us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.